today I'm going to talk about a specific project, the San Francisco Living Seawall Pilot Study. And just um, for those of you who might not be familiar with our organization, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is a research uh, outlet of the Smithsonian Institution. Um, CERC, as we're known, is based mainly back in Edgewater, Maryland, but we have a small group of folks who are based in Tiburon at San Francisco State University's Marine Lab, the Estuary and Ocean Science Center. And we've been there and working in the Bay since the year 2000. The main objective for the San Francisco Living Seawall Pilot is to um, build a better habitat for bay species along the seawall or bulkhead that frames the Embarcadero area of San Francisco. Um, modern seawalls or bulkheads tend to be vertical structures. They tend to be quite smooth. And while they're similar in many ways to rocky shore habitats, they're not exactly like them, a much more simplified type of substrate and many of our native species can't or don't use them. While conversely, many of our non-native species, which tend to be weedier generalist species do use them. Uh, there's a growing body of literature from around the world that suggests if you can modify seawalls so that they have design elements that are similar to things that you see in nature. So things that are complex, things that uh, roofs, crevices, pits, water retaining features, a lot of interstitial spaces, that you get a positive species response. More species are able to use these. And a number of harbors and estuaries around the world have experimented with this on larger scales. There's a fairly well-known project in Sydney Harbor where they added these tiles that are um, meant to look like mangrove prop roots to a, a seawall there an extensive project in Seattle that added texture to vertical seawall, um, among many other modifications that they made. And we have reason to believe that if we, uh, if we can build complex structures in San Francisco Bay, that we're going to have a positive response in terms of species diversity. And one of our uh, early lines of evidence for this is looking at this seawall, which fronts the marina green area facing north, and it is an unusual seawall for San Francisco. It's composed of a series of bricks that are mortared together, and they go down stepwise rather than being um, completely vertical. So lots of small spaces in between the bricks, some variation in slope. You've got some horizontal, some sloped, some vertical. And you can see just by looking at this picture, the differences in the, the different types of seaweeds that are there. So this is, this is a highly diverse community. What are the species that I'm talking about that might respond to this type of treatment? Um, some examples are some of our um, native seaweeds like the feather boa kelp, the rainbow seaweed, um, many, um, there are many different red seaweeds that are in San Francisco Bay that we expect to find along these habitat types. And then there's a whole suite of associated fauna. There's chitons and limpets, bay mussels and litterines and other snails, and mobile fauna like isopods and hermit crabs, nudibranchs and rock crabs. Specifically, there are a few species that we're very interested in trying to promote within San Francisco Bay. One of these is the native Olympia oyster, Austria lurida which is of interest because it's the only oyster native to the west coast of North America. And we know along its range that the population is in decline from historic numbers. The oyster provides food and habitat for many other species and provides ecosystem services such as nutrient cycling and water filtration. And because of that, it's been the target of restoration efforts along the west coast for a number of years. Another species that uses the rocky shores or hard shores in San Francisco is the rockweed Fucus disticus, which is found from the mid to high intertidal zone. It's considered a foundation species. You can see the canopy that it makes um, could be particularly important at low tide in creating a moist and cool environment. 
It provides food and habitat for many other species. And it's not good at dispersing on its own. So if there's an impact to a population along one segment of the shoreline, it's very hard for it to come back. So that's this species has been a target for mitigation funding, such as for the Cosclobacene oil spill. And then there's the Pacific herring, which is really important for supporting bay food webs, including a commercial fishery for humans. And the herring requires hard substrate for spawning. It's a fairly indiscriminate spawner. So whatever is in the intertidal zone, shallow subtidal, it'll put eggs on. Um, and it tends to, um, to do this in the central bay. Here's um, some of the historic um, spawning grounds in the bay, but sometimes far down into South Bay. And macroalgae, like the ones I just showed you, is, are really the best substrate for herring, for the development of herring eggs. So we'd like to promote that for the herring as well. So our um, pilot project along San Francisco's waterfront asked the main question of what happens if you add texture to a vertical seawall? And we're doing this using um, tiles like the ones shown here, which are made by e-concrete. And um, we're also asking whether different material types um, are important as well as scale. So if we deploy tiles that are say one foot by one foot, do we get the same effect if we do a bunch of those as compared to a large tile, like a three by six foot tile? We're also interested in this question about how species respond to surface complexity over a range of tidal elevations from just below um, mean low or low water to higher up and across the gradient that is in San Francisco of wave exposure and salinity. And ultimately the goal is to use the results of this experiment to inform the design of the current seawall, which needs to be renovated. It's a hundred years old. There's concerns about its seismic safety. It also needs to come up higher because of uh, flooding issues with sea level rise. Um, the city is preparing to rebuild this seawall. And if we can learn some things about how it could become better habitat as well as protect the shoreline, the goal would be to incorporate those into the seawall. So this is what the project looks like. Um, this is our site that's near the agriculture building right there on the Embarcadero. You can see it at low tide if you walk by. Um, and here's an example of the large tile that we're testing. And these are the smaller tiles. You can see two of the tidal elevations. The lowest elevation is underwater in this photograph. We have the three sites, as I mentioned. Sorry, these are very small uh, little dots here, but this one is Pier 45. Here's the agriculture building site. And then we have a site on the breakwater of um, South Beach Marina. So this spans a fairly marine location to a more estuarine location along property owned by um, the port. And to reiterate, we have three tidal elevations. We have three different types of tiles and two sizes of tiles we're looking at. Currently, we have two years funded to collect data on these communities as they develop. And the data we're collecting are species identifications and abundance. Um, and I'm going to show you some briefly some results. Um, these were deployed in the fall of 2022. Um, so these are some results from um, year one plus. So one of the first things we noticed is that we had rapid recruitment to the tiles of native seaweeds. These are some examples, um, a lot of those red seaweeds that I mentioned earlier, here's the feather boa kelp and my colleague Corinne using it as a feather boa in the field. Um, here's an example of one of the tiles pulled up from the lowest tidal elevation this summer. You can see this gorgeous Maziella, the iridescent or rainbow seaweed on there. There's been a diverse assemblage of animals colonizing the tiles. So we have, we have snails, we have limpets, chitons, here's a little native oyster, um, a native bryozoan, and a nudibranch. Some mobile fauna include hermit crabs, civic rock crabs, shore crabs, and um, a few small fish. 
And um, overall, we have um, about 90 plus uh, distinct taxa that have settled across the tiles. There are far more native species than non-natives. We have about um, 13 species that are non-native species. One of the things we're finding is that location really matters. So each site, each of those three sites have a slightly different assemblage from one another. And that's not super surprising, uh, but it's interesting to see this happen. So we have a few more species um, on our site that's the more marine site, and those tend to be species found also on the open coast. We're also finding there's far more species in the low intertidal than the high or mid. And we have more species on the textured tiles as compared to the flat tiles. One of those species is the native oyster, far more oysters on the textured tiles as opposed to the flat tiles. And in particular, we see more of the native oysters higher up in the intertidal zone on the textured tiles compared to the flats. So this suggests that those tiles perhaps provide better um, better habitat for settling oysters, but also may mitigate the effects of heat stress during low tide by providing crevices and shady spots and moisture retention. Um, so we still have a bit of time to go with this project. We will be completing our full second year of monitoring this fall, early winter fall. Um, we are continuing to fundraise for monitoring this. We'd like to have five years of, um, of monitoring in situ. This, is, this seems really important to us because we know it takes a while for these communities to develop. And also because year by year, things can be quite different in the Bay, as all of you know. Um, ultimately, the plan is to remove the small tiles at the end of the monitoring to bring them into the lab for um, more detailed morphological surveys, as well as using eDNA techniques to um, survey the tiles for organisms that may be difficult to see or ID um, based on morphology. And then we would like to take this um, a step further, and we do have funding to do this to look at an ecosystem function, to compare ecosystem function um, of primary productivity between the different tile types using um, gas exchange. And then ultimately what we wanna do is work with the port to translate these findings into the seawall design. So just to clarify, the idea isn't to go ahead and put tiles up on the existing seawall, but to take these design ideas and translate them so that they're built into the seawall as it is built, as it is renovated. Um, so just briefly, what's, what's next? Um, we are working now to um, try to raise funds to try out some of the other gray to green ideas that are out there. And we would love to test these more broadly in the Bay. As we've learned, even within the small area along the waterfront in San Francisco, we really do see some differences site by site. And so we'd like to understand that better within the larger bays context. Um, I just want to briefly bring up a few of these other ideas and bring you back to the Seattle seawall, which was actually a very ambitious um, and complex um, uh, seawall modification. Again, they like San Francisco, they had an old seawall. It was existing, but it was it, there were seismic concerns. There were concerns about its ability to um, protect the shoreline in flood events, and so they needed to renovate. And they decided to do this with a focus of salmon because salmon are huge in the Seattle area. And so the new seawall had a number of features, including um, ways that overhangs um, could be modified to allow light down into the water below. They had the complex um, surfaces on the vertical. They had some horizontal slopes and they um, raised up uh, they had marine mattresses to raise up the bottom so that young salmon could swim in well-lighted shallow water as opposed to the very deep water which exists right along the seawall. Um, so here's a view from above. You, you wouldn't know it walking across it, but these are all the light emitting structures that allow light to penetrate down, which allows seaweeds to grow. And then the small crustaceans that make their home in seaweeds. This is food for juvenile salmon. And um, at last, last I checked in with this project, 
there's tens of thousands of small salmon that are using this new project as a migration corridor. And then what about some of the other ideas like water retaining features? Um, we know these are being experimented in, with in a number of places. So putting manufactured um, tide pools into elements like uh, riprap or maybe attaching them to vertical seawalls. Um, we know there's one example in San Francisco Bay to date with some, some tide pools, but there's uh, very few of them and we, we need more with some more careful monitoring. And then I would like to just point out, here's my next slide, that there's a lot of hard shoreline in the bay right now. You, it's shown here in the purple. Um, so especially Central Bay, lots and lots of hardened shoreline structures where we could think about, could we add these types of modifications to build better habitat? And with sea level rise um, heading our way, we're only going to see more of this. Um, so I'll end right there. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.